All right, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the webinar series for the International Social Capital Association. Um, the association's mission is to advance the research and application of social capital and the, the association is now welcoming new members so you can uh, have a look at the website and, and you're welcome to join us. In this session, uh, we welcome Dr. Mason Matthews for a presentation and discussion about how social capital is created and maintained to achieve development goals. Mason Matthews is an assistant research professor at the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University. Mason is interested in social networking and social capital theories and methods and how they can be combined with geographic information systems to understand how communities and individuals respond to social, economic and environmental shocks. Mason's current research focuses on how different types of collaboration shape societal outcomes and resilience of individuals and communities. Mason is currently studying university community partnerships into organizational collaboration and collaboration across nation state boundaries. Mason's research is designed not only to generate new knowledge regarding these research topics, but also to produce tools that can be used by different segments of society to enhance their capacity to form partnerships and collaborate across organizational, disciplinary and geographic boundaries. So it's great welcome, a great opportunity to welcome Mason um, and over to you for a short presentation. Thank you, Tristan, for that great introduction. Um, today, I'm gonna to discuss some research findings regarding how people create configurations of bonding, bridging and linking social capital to achieve development goals. And I'm also going to discuss a little bit about why these configurations are so difficult to maintain over time. Um, this research occurred several years ago, and so it's kind of unique to a specific time and place, but I'm hoping that the, the findings are relevant to people working in other contexts as well. Um, so the research questions that I want to um, try to address today are the following. What are examples of development goals and objectives that require people to combine the three types of social capital in order to achieve? What are examples of the micro sociological processes that people use in order to create, maintain, and combine the three types of social capital? What are some of the costs and benefits of combining the three types of social capital? And why are these combinations so difficult to maintain over time? So I think it, sometimes it helps to just get the um, basic definitions in order. So for this research, I'm using the definition of social capital that was um, created by Bourdieu and Lynn, in which um, social capital is this combination of resources and the networks of relationships in which they're embedded. And then for bonding social capital, I'm following, following Coleman and Putnam, who said that hor it's horizontal relationships between individuals who share characteristics and belong to identifiable, identifiable groups such as kin and community. And then for bridging social capital, I'm also following Putnam in that there are relationships that cross social strata or other boundaries that differentiate people. And then for the linking social capital, I'm drawing on um, Stretzer and Wolcock that said there were ties that traverse hier hierarchical social strata, as well as differences in power, social status, and wealth. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about these the combinations of social capital and how people use them to achieve development goals. And this research, I'm trying to contribute to a, a growing body of research. And these are a few examples that I found really interesting as I was doing my literature review. So one example is from Hawkins and Maurer. They were looking at um, disaster recovery after Hurricane Katrina, and they found that people who combined bonding social capital in the form of social support with bridging social capital in the form of resources from outside their community had better recovery outcomes. And then another interesting example was um, Harrison et al. They did some research in the Pacific Northwest in which they found that people with combinations of bonding, bridging and linking social capital had more adaptive capacity than those with bonding social capital alone. And then another one that I found really interesting was from Kofere Bravo et al. And they were looking at how Chilean fruit farmers with the capacity to balance the three types of social capital were more successful at acquiring and adopting new technologies. So those are kind of some examples of de development um, 
issues that require combinations of social capital. And my research was focusing on how riverine leaders and the Brazilian Amazon used configurations of social capital to achieve their development goals. And so <clears throat> I think in any case, when you're talking about social capital, the context just means a lot. So I don't know if a few slides and pictures and maps are gonna be able to convey that context, but I, I will try. Um, so this research was done in the southwestern part of the state of Amazonas in Brazil, in the municipality of Labria, which is about a thousand kilometers upriver from um, Manaus on the Purus River. And it's also connected to the um, road network through the, the famous Trans-Amazon Highway, the BR-230, and the town of Labria was a kind of terminal point of that highway. And so for my research, I wanted to do a mixed methods approach. So I started with a position generator and that's a method developed by Lynn and, and Duman in 1986. And what they did was ask people about their connections with people from different occupations, dentist, doctor, lawyer, et cetera. And I had to modify that. So I was asking people in riverine communities about their connections with people in occupations, but also in specific organizations. So NGOs, social movements, government agencies, other forms of linking capital organizations that they might be able to obtain resources from. So in order to do that, I created a proposed sample of um, different communities uh, on the Purus and Itushi rivers. And I did interviews with 96 different people, leaders and non-leaders and people in different age groups. Um, so that was, I wanted to get a quantitative measurement of social capital, specifically linking social capital from the position generator. But then I also did um, two years of ethnography where I was doing historical timeline interviews with older inhabitants. Um, I did a lot of interviews with people in riverine communities, but also in people with people they interacted with. So river traders, people who were part of the former rubber economy, um, people in government agencies, social movement leaders, all types of different people, people in the Catholic Church. Um, and I also did production calendars to try to understand people's engagement with markets and the outside world, because I think this also is important to understand different facets of, of social capital. Um, so another thing to mention is, um, People in riverine communities are um, in this area were descendants of the 19th century rubber boom. So they had originally migrated in the 19th century from states in the Northeast like Sierra. Um, and then they um, mixed with indigenous people who were living there. So they were um, engaging in these traditional livelihood activities where they're um, doing things like collecting Brazil nuts, doing some rubber, tap or rubber tapping, collecting things like um, anjiroba oil, copaiba oil for international markets, and a lot of subsistence fishing, subsistence hunting. Uh, the Purus is a, a river that has really heavy sediment loads, so they were able to do farming on the beaches every year. So they're partially engaged in international markets, but they're also doing a lot of traditional livelihood activities for subsistence. Um, and then another thing, I guess that I, is important to mention is um, Labadee kind of sits at this inflection point um, between the older kind of Amazon development model where it's extractive industries, forest products, and people traveling by rivers alone. And then the new model where people, where the government's putting in roads and you have connection to markets through, through roads. So people in Labadee were kind of sitting on the the inflection point of those two development models. Um, you can see the pictures in the bottom right was the Trans Amazon in 2008, 2009, you know, dirt road um, closed half the year. And since then it's been improved. Um, so what happens when you have some of the, that road development is often um, some of the stuff that's going on with deforestation and, um, people bringing in cattle ranching and monoculture and other types of activities. And you get a lot of conflict between resource users from a, let's say an older phase of development with the newer phase of development. Um, and so there's a lot of land tenure confusion, who has rights to what resources, a lot of conflict over resources. So you get the pictures on the right where people are 
trying to establish land tenure claims. Pictures on the left where, you know, these are riverine people from Labria who are um, engaging in protests in Brasilia to try to consolidate their, their land tenure claims and working with social movements to try to um, protest in their, um, to get their land tenure and resource access rights. And one of the only ways they could do this was to create extractive reserves where they get usufruct rights to the land and resources. And then indigenous communities were also trying to create indigenous areas to consolidate their land tenure claims. And so creating these reserves is a process that often requires people to combine the three types of, of social capital. Um, and so another thing, I think that the historical context is also really essential to understand how people uh, create and maintain their social capital. And so again, trying to consolidate decades and decades and stuff in one slide is kind of difficult, but some of the key points in some of these riverine, well, in all the riverine communities, there were different phases of social mobilization. So in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you have the liberation theology movement with the Catholic Church, which was had a very pro-poor approach, where they're not only teaching people to read and write, to, um, to um, preach the gospel, and to try to uh, overcome a lack of priests and nuns in rural areas, but they were also encouraging people to mobilize and even to contest existing power structures. So people were learning how to build social capital, learning how to organize, learning how to make connections, learning how to make alliances. Um, I talked to the, the Bishop of Labria at the time, he'd come as a Spanish priest in 1970, and he said they'd formed something like 200 different Christian-based communities in these riverine communities. Um, so people were learning to organize. Um, and then that was followed by the uh, rural union um, workers movement where people in um, rural areas were also wanting to establish workers' rights and retirement benefits and those types of things. So more, another kind of wave of social mo mobilization. Then in, you know, in the 1980s and um, 90s, you ha also have the rise of social movements based on ethnicity, indigenous social movements, quilombolas, and then also uh, social movements based on livelihood strategies like the famous rubber tappers movements, uh, movement with Chico Mendez. And people are also learning to mobilize and organize and form alliances during that period. And then also uh, as a result of Brazil's return to democracy, they started to regain some of those rights of association and things that helped them kind of mobilize to a, a larger degree. And then in the 1990s, you have the international interest in the Amazon and an influx of um, development workers, NGOs, and millions of dollars for either conservation or sustainable development. So people are learning over that time also that there are ways to access those types of development funds to try to improve their lives. And so people in the river in riverine communities had a lot of different development goals. Some of the most Existential were obviously uh, consolidating their land tenure and resource access and so they could maintain their um, traditional livelihood strategies. They wanted to reinvigorate the forest economy so they could continue to do things like collect Brazil nuts and do some of the activities they'd always done. They obviously wanted more health and education and they're trying to do all this with these competing national and international development visions. So on one hand, you have a lot of opportunities and you know people with a, a vision of the Amazon as a place for conservation and sustainable development, but you also have other people with a vision that's based on monoculture and ranching and other development activities. So they're kind of trying to thread that needle of different development visions and this changing landscape of linking social capital opportunities with a bunch of different organizations that they can potentially um, partner with to get assistant, assistance and to access um, development um, opportunities and to fulfill their development goals. Um, and a lot of times these development goals require, again, the combinations of bonding, bridging, and linking. So this slide shows some of the position generator results that I, that I um, was able to get, and I was focusing, using the position generator to measure linking social capital. Um, so I don't think it would work as well for bonding or bridging, but, but for linking, I was able to 
create a list of 41 different occupations, but also, as I said before, organization names and government agency names and you know, religious organization names. And then ask people, I asked people three questions about that list of names, which ones they recognized, which ones they had contact with, and then which ones they had contact with in their communities. And I found basically the recognition um, there wasn't a lot of difference between leaders and non-leaders, and there were other predictors that also determined whether or not people recognize the organizations. But then when you get to contact, leaders had more contact than non-leaders. And then also people living in the extractive reserves also had more contact. And I attribute that to the fact that these so many of these organizations wanted to create the reserves also. So they were um, mobilizing people. And then when you get to community contact, leaders had even more contact than non-leaders. And so this was kind of a baseline. Um, and then the thing that I found really interesting was to use the ethnography to try to explain why this was the case. So maybe it's just not a shocking finding to, to find out that leaders have more contact than non-leaders. But when you start to dig into the ethnography, I think you can start to unpack that in, in interesting uh, ways. And so by micro sociological processes, I'm talking about the day-to-day -day exchanges and interactions and behaviors that are essential to create these relationships. So trying to understand what those are and how people use them to maintain relationships. Um, particularly in the context that people have limited time and energy and they're trying to create three different types of social capital. So they have different processes for each type. Um, and so this was where I depended on these historical timeline interviews and a lot of participant observation during meetings, traveling to villages, spending time with people, um, and just interacting with them to try to understand those processes. <clears throat> this is one example um, from the, the linking, the processes that leaders used to obtain linking social capital. And when I was going into this, I was envisioning linking social capital as kind of a one-way thing where somebody with fewer resources and less power is kind of seeking a relationship with somebody with more power and more resources and then accessing those resources. And an interesting thing, you know, spending all the time with these leaders and traveling with them and going to meetings, I started to learn that this was kind of a two-way relationship actually because people in these groups and organizations now, they're more powerful and they have more resources, but that doesn't mean they don't periodically need things from rural communities. So people in development organizations and government agencies, let's say they need to roll out a development project in a rural area, they often need the buy-in from people living in those areas. So even though they're more powerful, they periodically need something from those communities. And River, the leaders were in a, um, a perfect position to help them achieve those goals. So in terms of micro sociological processes, some of the things that I saw leaders doing, one of those, one of the ways they attracted relationships from these groups and organizations was just to guide them to the villages because um, these remote villages, they don't have signs on how to get there. You know, a lot of the, the houses look the same, the villages look the same. So they would need leaders to even guide them to get there. Um, and then when they arrive, leaders can vouch for them, vouch for their presence. Somebody who arrives in one of these villages unannounced might be viewed with suspicion. You know, a lot of times visits from government agencies don't bode well. You know, people might be um, kicked off the land because they don't have an official title or something like that. But if a leader vouches for somebody, then that can make all the difference for somebody in an outside organization connecting with a community. And then also just the multiplier effect of a leader being able to connect somebody from an outside organization to multiple people very easily, instead of that person having to form one by one by one those relationships. And then another process that I saw that allowed leaders to attract relationships from linking social capital organizations was their capacity to interpret, validate, and transmit the messages that those groups and organizations want to spread in the communities. So even though everybody was speaking Portuguese, the Portuguese that people speak in very rural areas was very different from uh, the Portuguese somebody would speak in an urban in an urban area, you know, highly technical terms and those types of things. So leaders were often, you know, asked to interpret 
interpret these messages to people in their villages and also validate the message and say, hey, this is something that's good for our community, as opposed to somebody trying to go to a community and just tell them that it's good. If the leader says that it's good, then that makes a huge difference. Um, and so leaders who are able to do this were able to establish these reputations as somebody who knows people and gets things done. And so again, they, you know, they, they were able to attract some of these relationships. And then um, in the seeking side of things, the rivering leaders would often have to travel to these towns and knock on doors and go from one agency to another and try to get face time. So anyway, the, the main finding for me there was the, the two-way process of this, which I, I wasn't as expecting as much when I started the research. And then the bonding and bridging social capital also have interesting two-way um, micro-sociological processes. Um, and so extractive reserves, they're one of their main development goals. Um, they were looking for this, as I said, as a way to establish tenure rights, protect their livelihoods, and a way of participating in a meaningful way in development decisions, and also as a way to um, access other types of development funds for housing improvements and, and farming uh, implement improvements and those types of things. So this was a, um, creating these reserves was a really complex process that required them to use all three types of social capital. So often, you know, things would start in one village where you know, people would say, hey, we're going to get pushed off the land. We don't have a title. And so they would start to bond together as a village and try to find out a way to, let's say, get a, an extractive reserve created. But then they found that the government's not going to create one for one community. You have to have 20 or 50 communities. So now you need bridging social capital with other villages and to create this kind of critical mass, which is necessary for a collective action. And then, of course, if you're going to create a reserve, you absolutely have to have those government agencies that can help you through all the paperwork. And then social movement organizations were also helping them, NGOs, religious organizations. So in order to create these big reserves, they really needed all three types and they needed to be able to blend them together. Um, and so one of the things that I also found that was essential um, was meet, were meetings. And so the main you know, meetings and assemblies are the way, the way that people um, spread information and communicate, particularly for these communities that don't have telephones or, or internet. Um, so people from outside would hold meetings and, you know, tell people how these development programs work, you know, what the benefits are, why they should participate. And the meetings also depended on leaders, social capital, and they also depended on them to bring the three types of social capital together. So they had to use their bonding social capital to, to convince family, friends, and neighbors to attend. And then since they needed multi-village um, participation, bridging capital was important to coordinate with other leaders, identify the best, best places to hold meetings. And then the meetings, you know, coordinating with uh, these government agencies and NGOs for everything, logistics, food, travel, how are we gonna get people there? all those types of things. So the meetings also required leaders to bring together the different types of social capital. Um, and so one of the things that I also found interesting was when they're able to do these meetings and pull these off, it actually enables them to enhance all three types of social capital because if the meeting is successful, it, it has benefits for people in those three types of relationships. So for their bonding social capital, if the meeting leads to an influx of resources or resolves existential, existential problems, then the, the leader's bonding social capital can be enhanced. And the same if the meeting has you know, benefits to other villages, then their bridging social capital can be enhanced. And if the meeting helps these government agencies and NGOs achieve their goals in rural areas, then that leader looks good and can help enhance they're linking social capital. So, so able, being able to bring them can all actually lead to this mutually reinforcing nature of the social capital where all three types were enhanced. Um, and so, as I said, the, the, they had to have all three types in order to get these reserves created because it's such a complex process and you do have to have a critical mass and you do have to have collective action. And it's also essential to maintain these reserves if you have to, you know, have communication with the outside agencies, 
people have to be on the same page in terms of how resources are used. So I think this is just one example of development, collective development goals that require all three types of social capital. But I also found that these configurations can be incredibly difficult to maintain over time. And so you have clashes between the different micro sociological processes that are required to maintain each type of social capital. And, and other people have written about this. There's this tension between, particularly between bonding social capital, you know, which often um, you have this homophily process where bonding social capital exists between people who share the same characteristics, the birds of the feather flock together idea. And then you're bridging and linking social capital more heterophilus in terms of people being different, different characteristics. So the homophily is good, it creates cohesion for bonding, but at some point it can turn into an us versus them thing where you know you have tension between the bonding and bridging. And I saw this in these riverine communities where a leader would have to spend time in other villages or particularly in you know a place like Manaus or Brasilia and people suddenly in their in their village would say, oh, you think you're so fancy now, you're spending all this time with these fancy people somewhere else. What, you think you're better than us now? You don't have time for us anymore. And so you start to see tensions on that micro sociological level, just um, trying to maintain that. And this was partially because of the, the time constraints for, for these leaders with Amazonian geographies, and they had to be in different places to maintain the different types of social capital. So you have to be in your village and spend a certain amount of time there for bonding. You probably have to have time in, in other communities to maintain your bridging. And then you need to be in urban areas sometimes to maintain, to get that face time that you need to maintain relationships with people in um, government agencies. <clears throat> Another thing, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Another thing that I saw is sometimes project success can actually lead to complications in maintaining the different types of social capital. So if you have a poor community and you have a sudden influx of resources as a result of a successful project, now you have the problem of how are those resources are going to be allocated. And if let's say in the village, only the leader's family benefits from the project, now the other bonding relationships with neighbors and friends start to falter or if only one village, only one village, the leader's village benefits, then other people in other villages might say, hey, what about us? And so then the bridging ties might start to falter if resources aren't allocated in a certain way. And then when that happens, people in these linking organizations say, hey, this leader is not allocating resources correctly. And so those ties start to falter. So project success can lead to tension in social capital relationships. And then I also saw project failure. People, if, if people sit in these endless meetings and they're taking time away from their livelihood activities and the project doesn't lead to anything, that can reflect poorly on the leader. And they say, hey, we spent all this time in meetings and nothing happened. So, um, and then just the, the, the burden of all of these relationship responsibilities can make it really hard to maintain these combinations over time. Um, and then, Finally, the, there are pros and cons to um, leadership for these, for these riverine leaders. So the pros, you know, access to information, project funds, travel opportunities, relationships that they, non-leaders probably don't have access to. But then they're also trying to balance these endless requests for advice and information and assistance when they're doing all this time traveling and maintaining relationships in other places they have less time for their, their own activities, farming, fishing, and collecting. And then just the exhausting politics and time consuming nature of relationship maintenance. And then a lot of these leaders that I had spent time with, they weren't receiving any kind of a salary or comp compensation for all this work. They were doing this to help their communities and to help their families. And so they spent years often without any kind of salary or uh, compensation. And then finally, I was often in awe of them doing all this work and facing just constant death threats. A lot of the people that I worked with um, were facing death threats and rural assassinations. This is a map from the Pastoral Land Commission, which has been tracking this since at least 1985. There are just hundreds of 
assassinations in rural areas and the recent news with the um, the British journalist and the, um, the um, Funai employee is just one example, but there are you know hundreds of these types of assassinations that occur once somebody gains a reputation as somebody who's able to mobilize their community, they're at very um, great risk. So that's another thing that makes these uh, social capital configurations difficult to maintain. Um, and so that's that's kind of the, um, the, the gist of the presentation. Um, and this is the, the publication that we sent, that was sent out earlier, and then some of the other publications that, that I cited during the, the presentation. So um, again, always, I'm always very thankful. I had tremendous access when I was there. People were incredibly generous with their time and letting me spend time in their communities and um, ask them endless questions and things like that. So I don't think this type of research is possible without um, the help of the communities that are doing research in. So um, I hope that wasn't too too long or too boring. So uh, that's <laughs> fascinating, Mason. And I can you can see how you really had so much access to that commu those communities and like describing in rich detail the context of the research really helps to us to understand the research perspective and and the findings then really illuminate themselves so much. So what we're going to do is uh, Mason and I are going to have a, a discussion about about his research and this presentation just for a little while and then we'll open it up to questions from everybody else as well. So if you think of any questions as you go, feel free to post them in your chat. And when we get to the question time, you can also raise your hand within Zoom um, and you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. If you, if you aren't in a position to do that due to noise or language or any other reasons, feel free to post in the chat and let us know as well in the chat that you'd like us to read it out for you. And I'll be, well, I'll be happy to do that. Um, so, so Mason, um, one of the things you observed in the paper was that leaders did not seek every relationship to build linking social capital, that outsiders were often compelled to come to them. But you also identified as well that there was a huge amount of variety in the ways in which different leaders responded to that opportunity. So I was interested in, in whether or not some became um, distrusting or cynical as a result of being constantly put in that position of being approached for, for things um, and also whether or not some leaders perhaps started to use their position for exploitation or to, to further their own interests. And I know there's a huge amount of variety from leader to leader, but I, I'm interested in your thoughts about that. Yeah, the, just across the spectrum. And then also I found that there was often kind of like a core group of a few really influential leaders and then also kind of subgroups of leaders who were involved in a lot of the meetings but perhaps not driving them as much as this core group of a few people um, but yeah I would see people um, sometimes the pressures it's just too much and people fall off after a few years or and then there's also things that are really hard to measure right um, things like charisma how do you measure charisma how do you measure somebody's capacity to um, to just light up a room or just to attract those types of ties to convince people of what they're saying, all of those types of things. Some people had more of that than others. Um, so those things are also really hard to, to quantify. But and, and then the, the thing where people take advantage, um, it's really tricky. You know, you, you have, um, as I said, some of these people would just work endlessly with no salary or anything for years and years. And then suddenly resources are in their community and, and, and that's when the resource allocation problems would, would start to crop up and, and you would see things perhaps not get distributed um, equally or there's just the perception that they're not. And so perception also throws a, a wrench into these things because the rumor mill can be incredibly vicious. And even though people are disconnected in terms of not having phones, Rumors also spread really quickly in development projects about who's getting what, who's doing what, how things are happening. So. Well, I think this the example of leaders illustrates the, the importance of roles in shaping in the way social capital forms in any particular area. And certainly Norman Uphoff is an author who's written probably the first author to really write about that, I think, and has written quite extensively about the, the importance of roles. And I think we often... Um, a lot of the 
the criticism for social capital going back to the World Bank era, you know, 25 years ago, was that social capital was used to put the blame on poor people, you know, basically by saying, look, you don't have the right kinds of relationships and that's why you're poor. And if you can go and make some of these bridging or linking type of relationships, then you won't be poor anymore. And, and that received quite a lot of criticism, of course. But I think that your research and the way you've done it illustrates how social capital can be used to illuminate these the, the contexts, illuminate the ways in which these relationships form um, without passing any blame, without being, being negative in that kind of way. Um, so I'm kind of interested in where you see the benefits of a concept like social capital for conducting research, for understanding your research context. What do you think the main benefits of the, the concept of social capital is? Yeah, and it's hard because that... Um... Sometimes I, I still have to go back to the literature and figure out exactly what, what it means. And um, it's been used in so much of the literature. Um, but yeah, I just uh, trying to think of a good answer, just how people access resources that they don't have and the relationships that they use to do that. Um, and then just trying to put that in a historical context. Um, and so one of the things that I didn't mention was this area during the rubber boom, they spent 100 years in the system of really strong patron client ties, you know, where somebody would have a really a rubber tapper would have a relationship with a, a setting gall owner, which is somebody who controlled an area of forest that they worked in. And it was almost like a company store relationship where you would have to buy all your supplies from that person, that person provided some kind of protection. And so very strong relationship. And now they're having to um, use a multitude of relationships to access resources. So I think social capital can also be used to compare different types of relationships. That's one of the things I was trying to just do in my dissertation was understand this transition from patron client ties to um, you know, different types of relationships. And I think um, the bonding, bridging and linking is a way to describe those and then try to understand the smaller processes associated with each one. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Uh. Well, yeah, I think it does. I mean, I, it sounds like social capital provides that way to, to put the emphasis on the nature of social relationships in economic development that may otherwise be overlooked if we're if we just simply focus on, you know, the creation of markets or, um, you know, connecting peers. I mean, that is social relationships, but connecting people to buyers and sellers and like that tends to be a lot of the focus of economic development. And I guess social capital provides that way to say, well, actually, the way in which social relationships provide opportunities to resources is also really important. Yeah, and it's just one piece of the puzzle, right, trying to understand. So I think maybe what you were saying earlier is they were placing a lot of emphasis on the social capital and having the relationships, but maybe that's just one piece of the puzzle. People who have successful economic development also might have other attributes that, that you know, they're good, they have a good business sense or, you know, they have something else. So maybe just laying all of the, you know, having social capital be the one independent variable that explains some kind of an economic development variable is, is also an issue when you have a multitude of things that explain, you know, that kind of um, success or failure and when it comes to economic development. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Mason, do you want to stop your screen share so that we can, sure. everyone can see each other a little more? Okay. Right. Um, so, Someone made a comment in the chat, and it seems strikes me that the leaders and people in this in this context, the riverine people, they seem to uh, understand the importance of, of social capital, social relationships quite intuitively, and they prioritize that. You know, you talked about how the leaders they constantly go and they build these bridging ties, these linking ties, um, go and spend time in in NGOs' offices and build those linking ties. Even go back to to the, the households of, of these linking, linking relationships to build and foster. So it seems like they, they understand the importance of this and they put a lot of time and effort into building it. Do you think that an, like an explicit understanding of social capital would help them to develop that further? Like they seem to intuitively understand it or perhaps culturally it's important, but do you think social capital would help to further that? It would be interesting to, to I, I, I haven't been able to go back to Brazil just because I suffered a, a really severe injury after I did all that research, but 
you know, it'd be really interesting to go back and, and um, you know, talk to people about the concepts. Um, you know, I, and, you know, I was also talking to people about the patron client relationships. So they certainly understood how those work and they had their, you know, so I'm sure they have mental models on social capital relationships also, even if they don't call them the same thing that we're calling them, because they certainly did for the patron client ties of the past. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that that would be really interesting just to have that dialogue and, and understand how people understand the way they use relationships, you know, to get things done. But, you know, so how much of it do you think is cultural, that simply the culture of the society really drives the emphasis on these social relationships, or how much is it just the necessity of being a leader? I think there is a, there's definitely a cultural component, um, either that I haven't seen manifest itself the same way here in the U.S. in terms of how people are having to do things and the way they engage with people in um government agencies and things like that. So I, I think there's definitely a, a cultural component um, and just the way people in different social strata interact in Brazil, you know, that takes place. There's a great book by, um, it's called um, Insurgent Citizenship. Um, and he's talking about interactions between different people and how citizenship is distributed unequally in Brazil. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. I cited in the article, but that's just one example of how the cultural um, norms, you know, shape these things. Yeah. And you mentioned also in the article that the, there isn't technology, you know, there aren't mobile phones, there's, there's no internet connectivity. And so really all of these connections, they occur face to face. And this, and this so was, this was back then, this was in 2008, right. 2009. So as I was leaving the town of Labadeo was getting its first cell phone tower. Um, so, but yeah, they're the, the, they were yeah. What were you? So I think, were you well, I think it's fascinating that the face-to-face -face interactions clearly have the ability to create that level of connection that perhaps other forms of communication wouldn't be quite so effective in creating. And so I know I'm asking a little bit of crystal ball gazing with this question, but interested in your thoughts about how technology may change the dynamics in these kinds of areas where it was 100% face-to-face previously, but with the advent of technology, eventually there's going to be other ways for these leaders to be able to make contact and build these relationships. Yeah, I think it, it, it is interesting to see what, what will happen. Um, it certainly makes some things easier, although, you know, some people, when they look at their email inbox, they're like, oh my God, I don't have time to answer all of these emails. So it doesn't solve all of the time issues, but certainly would solve some of them. And, and certainly this thing of having to travel hundreds or even thousands of kilometers to try to meet with somebody in a linking organization and and actually try to you know have that communication to get things done um, would certainly change the dynamic, I think, tremendously. Yeah, and I guess it remains to be seen how that pans out, but certainly quite a lot of the research that I've seen suggests that technology, well, the current technologies we have at least, are most effective in, in maintaining social capital, but the face-to-face -face is still really essential in building it in the first place or creating that depth and level of connection, which then can be easily and cheaply maintained with technology. And so I guess it'll be interesting to see over time how it pans out in this area where the distances, like you mentioned, are so vast that leaders may just start text messaging or phone call to, to connect with other yeah. people in other areas. And that may end up actually um, eroding or decreasing the, the level of connection that they have with people in these other areas. Yeah, and it should be mentioned that most of the people who live in the Brazilian Amazon now live in urban areas. It's, it's you know, like everywhere else in the world, just massive rural urban migration. So Manaus has over 2 million people and Belém, you know, multiple millions of people and stuff. So, and the technology is obviously spread there with, you know, cell phones and stuff like that. So a lot of it is spread to the smaller towns like, like Labria. You know, I'm in contact with people in the town on Facebook, but not in the, in the riverine villages where they still didn't have the, you know, um, connections, but sometimes they could come to town and have an electronic connection there. Um, so yeah, those things. And I, I think also, as you said, the technology also allows you to have 
kind of latent relationships that you can that can be held on to and just you know reconnect with somebody on Facebook that you haven't spoken to in 10 years or five years or whatever it is, but you still have a way of connecting them, whereas previously you might have no way to to maintain that actual connection. So yeah. So it sounds like with technology, it may be possible if it's done quite carefully and strategically, it may be possible for leaders to spend more time at home, which was identified as one of the weaknesses if they spend too much time away. Yeah. So spend more time at home, but still maintain all of these connections that they have bridging and linking. Um, yeah. If it's done strategically and carefully, where they still have some face to face enough to build that connection, but then maintain it with the use of technology. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's totally interesting. Like that one of the leaders I traveled with when he, you know, was facing this existential threat, um, you know, his way of building, bridging social capital is every time he would go to town, he would pass through these 90 plus other villages, learn the names of every village and try to meet people in those villages stopping through and then discussing problems that they had in common. And so you can see how, that would be could accelerated with like a, a chat group or something like that or some other way as opposed to having to physically travel through all the villages although yeah. it, the, you, you know maybe the face actual face to face is a stronger way but then having those other networks um, you know would really you help. can certainly see the you know the pros and cons of it but i guess that one of the, the dangers is that if leaders just end up doing all of their communication using technology then they they may overall decrease the, their social capital and because yeah. as technology it becomes available all of the norms around the ways in which people communicate they, they, these norms need to be established and developed and changed and so during that period that it could be a real period of turmoil and upheaval and I guess that's where for me like an understanding of social capital and being able to work with these leaders from that perspective of social capital and, and what things mean may be really helpful to, for them to guide themselves through this kind of transition process or dynamic process of change. Yeah. So a methodological question, um, you did mixed method, which a lot of people say is an enormous challenge. Um, so I'm interested yeah. in how big a challenge that was to do, but also to reflect on like if you'd only done the quantitative portion, how your research findings would have been different. And also if you'd only done the qualitative portion, how your research findings would have been different. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I feel just so lucky of the access I had. And I just don't think if you don't have the access I had, I, I went to the University of Florida. So this was my dissertation research. And so my advisor had spent, you know, 30 years working in the Amazon. So she had connections in Brazil. So I was able to, to draw on those connections. And then also, there were, there's this big influx of students from Brazil, who um, who study at University of Florida, and, and many of them work in the government. And so one of my friends actually helped me get the permissions, and he introduced me to people in Labria who worked in the social movements. So I had it going in, I had connections based on those connections. I wouldn't have been able to do that research at all, just showing up as some, you know, unknown person. I had connections that opened the door for me. And then once I had, you know, built connections with people and social movements in town, they introduced me to riverine leaders. And then, you know, I traveled to the communities with leaders. They introduced me to people in the communities. And so, um, you know, I don't think you can do this research without that type of access and without the generosity of the people and without, you know, knowing people that lead to other connections that lead to other connections. And then in terms of the mixed methods, um, I had, I was there for two years. So that was, that's a long time. And I think, um, you know, in a perfect world, I would have had a quantitative measure also for the bonding and bridging, but that's just, you can only ask people so many questions and stuff. And so that can be an issue also. And then um, just that time of interacting with people and going to the offices and hanging out and going to meetings and traveling with people up and down these rivers. Um, that was just essential to try to understand those micro sociological processes. And if I think, I think if I just had the, the um, 
the position generator, the way I was using it, maybe it wouldn't have been really very interesting at all. People say, yeah, leaders have more context. So uh, what does that tell us? Whereas if you yeah. combine the two, I think it's interesting to try to unpack why that is, because I think that will change from place to place, right? Maybe, you know, leaders in other parts of the world also have more, more um, contacts, but there's other micro sociological processes that explain that. And so I think that's where the mixed methods were really illuminating for me just to try to dig in a little deeper and, you know, have a baseline of quantitative that tells me, yes, there are more contacts and then have the ethnography to help me ex try to explain why. Yeah. So it sounds like the majority of the findings really came from the qualitative component. If you started all over again, would you do the quantitative part? I think so. I think so. It's kind of a validation that, you know, I'm actually, and it can be replicated. So if somebody else wants to say, ah, I don't believe that you, that leaders have more contact, then that's something that they can just go in and, and do something very similar and, and measure that again. Um, so I, I, I would do the quantitative also. I think it's, it's worth it for that, that point. And then, um, you know, if that other finding, it wasn't just leaders, it was people in these reserves. And that shows you also that dual nature of linking social capital these people in these organizations often also wanted to create these reserves. And that came out in the position generator because people living in their in the reserves had more contact with these outside organizations than people living outside the reserve. So that was an interesting kind of other, you know, finding where the two kind of match together. So yeah. And I think your thinking about this echoes mine, and maybe it's because we're both geographers, but I certainly really like the mixed method approach and the explanation you gave for why you did it would be exactly the same one that I would give. But interestingly, in a fairly large survey of the literature I did a couple of years ago, I found that only about six or 7% of social capital research uses mixed method. And as a geographer, I was really surprised by that because I would have thought it would be the dominant approach, um, but it's mostly quantitative. Uh, and I think if you had used only quantitative, like you said, in this research, then you perhaps would have missed a lot of the richness and the detail of, of the findings that you produced. Um, so it's not really a question for you. It's really more a comment that I'd, I'd love to see more mixed method being used in, in social capital research. Yeah, it's hard. I think also, though, the time constraints of doing research. And, you know, as I said, I had incredible access and the generosity of the people and the networks of people that I knew to gain that access. and then. People just don't have the luxury of, you know, two years of dissertation research to do a social capital project. Yeah. So I think that that's maybe some of the reasons that a lot of times the, maybe the mixed methods don't get used, particularly if they're highly ethnographic like that, where you, you really need the accent, ac access and then time to observe and to interact and to, you know, participate in what's going on and understand it. So... Yeah, absolutely. Well, we could we could talk all day, but I want to get to other people's questions and and comments. Um, in the chat, it looks like Ronald probably has the first one. Ronald, do you want to unmute yourself? Ask your questions. I think Ronald is still here. Well, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, question. Let's have me go back to where I put it up here. It had to do with the role of corporations in either fostering or retarding the development of these uh, social capital efforts. What's your observation? And the second question is unionization, a part of the social capitalization process. So I, I didn't see a lot of corporations. One thing, I, I, the, the, some of the social movements were working with corporations, like I'm trying to remember the name, but some of the ones that were interested in forest products that were sustainably harvest, harvested, and so some of the oils and things like that, they would um, they wanted to sell sustainably harvested products, and so they were working with social movement organizations and government agencies, and so the social capital did play a role there because you know people in communities are able to get connected to some of these corporations who might want to buy sustainably harvested products products through their existing kind of networks of connections to people in the different social movements and government agencies. But I didn't see a lot of direct um, engagement with a lot of corporations at that time. It was mostly government agencies, 
social movement organizations, um, a lot of um, you know faith-based religious organizations and um, things like that. So, did they have a controlling influence, or were they just a, a moderating influence there? Who did these corporations, or not the corporations, but did the government agencies and the NGOs, did they have a moderating effect, or yes. was the controlling effect? Uh, certainly, they, you know, when they're creating the reserves, there are rules and regulations that go into the creation of the reserves and how they're put together, and the fact that they have to have um, an association that's going to be set up to, to set up rules and regulations. And um, so the government has a really, you know, heavy hand in the creation of the, of the reserves, but also, um, you know, social movement organizations play a, a huge role in, in getting those things done. And then um, there was also really um, this longstanding relationship between um, church organizations and the um, communities also. And um, that was also an interesting dynamic that I didn't talk about, but the kind of explosion of um, different Pentecostal church groups in Brazil, and um, but also the longstanding um, work of the Catholic Church, so. Um, was unionization a part of the process? Unionization, definitely the, um, the rural workers unions in Brazil, it's kind of a, you know, in urban areas, you might have an auto workers union or something like that. Brazil had this really big rural workers union throughout the country where, you know, you have this process of mechanization in the 20th century and people are being you know thrown off the land that they used to live on and work so people are clamoring for all types of workers rights and then there's a slave labor labor problem in brazil where people are working and not being paid and things like that in some of the rural areas and so um, that was in 60s 70s 80s where you have that rural workers union movement that was also highly influential in that area and there's still workers unions that are active and people can get things like retirement benefits if they can prove that they've been you know a, a family farmer for a certain number of years and things like that and so those unions are also involved in trying to help people with things like land tenure issues and um thank you yeah great uh next question i think is from josh josh feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question We can we can hear you, Josh. Oh, you can. Okay. Um, it's a little quiet. I'm not sure if microphone might be too far away. Uh, is this better? Maybe. It sounds like you're breaking up a little bit. Um, I'll just read out your question, and then you might be able to respond as well. Um, so, Josh was curious to hear about your experience in exploring social capital around university community partnerships and the power dynamics that might exist. I mean, that's an ongoing research project. So that is one of the things we're looking at is um, power dynam dynamics, but that's that's something that I've kind of just started working on. So um, we're doing interviews and looking at that, but I, I don't have any real findings to, to talk about yet, um, but that's an ongoing um, research project that I'm working on. Right, we'll be interested to see the, the results of that. Sorry, um, Josh also asked a question about um, assessing, I think was the, uh, the power of the, um, the rubber industry in the whole process. And I think Ron also had a question about um, the nature of the organizational involvement in the process as well. Yeah, so the, the main rubber, the main rubber boom was from 1850 to the beginning of the 20th century, 1910. And then, um, you know, the British started creating plantations in Southeast, Southeast Asia, and that really kind of collapsed the Amazon natural rubber industry. And then during World War II, they had a second boom when the um, Japanese took over those plantations in Southeast Asia. So that kind of brought Brazilian natural rubber um, production back up. And then it started to falter 
Um, you just can't compete in, these are natural forests where rubber trees are growing natively. But when you have a plantation, you can just overproduce. You can produce so much more with so much less effort as opposed to people walking from tree to tree dispersed in a forest. So the natural rubber production could never compete with the plantations. Um, and then Brazil tried to do some of its own plantations in the Amazon. Those failed because of different um, tree diseases and stuff like that. They do have some plantations in other parts of Brazil. Um, and then they started, um, you know, in World War II, of course, they came up with synth synthetic rubber. So that further um, damaged that. So basically, um, people were still collecting rubber, but they were doing it on a much, much, much lower scale. There was a municipal, a state, and even a federal subsidy that allowed them to do that. But that was the only thing that made it competitive for them to collect natural rubber, rubber in these areas. So that's why they were trying to, to um, do all these other activities like collect Brazil nuts, um, look at some of the different oils, um, do all the fishing, family farming, um, just um, a bunch of other forest um, activities. But the rubber, rubber collection had, you know, really was not the main thing that they were doing at that time. Um, but it was, it was a huge, huge um, part of the his history of that area. And that 19th century rub rubber boom led to that huge influx of people from other parts of Brazil into the Amazon. So again, there's just so much that can be talked about in terms of Brazilian rubber production. But... And Johan had a, a question in the chat. Um, and Johan, you can unmute yourself if you have a follow-up. Um, so they ask about what type of social capital do you think most was most influenced by that rubber industry dynamics? Uh, I know you talked about that in the article a little bit, that there really is some of that, um, that history is still really quite relevant to the current context. So the question was, what type of social capital do you think was most influenced by the rubber industry? Well, that when people had these really strong patron client ties where, you know, uh, somebody would would control an area of forest, as I said, and then, you know, the rubber tappers who tapped and lived in that particular forest were kind of beholden to that setting gal owner. And it was almost a company store type situation where they had to buy all their supplies, which are imported from urban areas from that person. And then it became, in many cases, kind of a debt peonage situation where they would pay back over years and years and years and never really be out of debt and stuff for the supplies that they purchased. So that's a radical change to a situation where you're having, because that in that case, you're kind of focusing, you know, you have this multiplex relationship with a patron who's an owner of the place where you live and they're your protector, they're your creditor, you know, they're your boss, they're all these things. And then when that system kind of collapses, now you're trying to use a bunch of different types of relationships to access resources. Um, so that was the main change um, that I saw there. I'm not sure if, if you know, the patron client tie would be one of those bonding, bridging or linking, or if it would be something where all of those three types of things might be rolled into one for a patron client tie where your patron is kind of linking you to the outside world, providing support, providing resources, and those types of things. Yeah. So Johan, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a follow-up question. Uh, you'd be welcome to. Uh, he, he says thank you. Uh, so we've got Mike next and then uh, Luz Helena and then we have Tim um, after that. So Mike, uh, would you like to unmute yourself, ask your question? I'll try to be quick, Dr. Matthews. You also are here in the US and we're so accustomed to thinking of economic development as a very positive thing. I think uh, uh, Robert Putnam in Bowling Alone describes about the Gilded Age of and, and rise of uh, fraternal organizations in this country following or hand in hand with immigration and so forth in the 1920s. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, about the possibility that, that um, um, economic development, both here in the US and in Brazil can be a, a two-edged sword. 
and with regard to social capital and possibly did you experience did you observe uh, did your research produce findings that said with the uh, rise of economic development social capital also encountered uh, you know some of the um, fragmentation that that I think has your, your comment about rumors got me to thinking about conspiracy theories here in the US and, and possibly because we've lost some social capital with economic uh, uh, good times, affluence. I'll stop. Yeah, I, I just, I, I didn't see parallels to like the social isol 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 isolation that is linked to like mass shooters and stuff like that, or this bowling alone thing where people are no longer engaging in um, sports activities or activities with groups and things like that. I, I didn't see that combination. So I'm trying to think of um, how to answer the, the question. And I, I guess I wasn't looking at it also from that, um, with those types of research questions. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how to. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking of, of previous decades where families were no longer uh, 10, 10 members living in two rooms of an apartment flat, but, you know, each uh, sibling had their own private room and wanted to eat dinner in it and, and the end of family meals and so forth and so on. And so, too, you know, with uh, the rise of, of, of um, prosperity, uh, people wanted to do what they wanted to do and didn't need one another in, as much anymore. Yeah, I could definitely see that maybe in, in urban areas of Brazil or, you know, other places, um, and, you know, people changing different levels of economic, you know, affluence and how that might shape the way they interact with other people. I think there's probably definitely, you know, research that might show some of those things. But the, the place where I was working, I... I I wasn't seeing that, you know. I understand. Well, thank you. Certainly an interesting question about how these kinds of macro level changes in, in society and, and values might might influence so social capital moving forward, um, particularly you know, the, we talked about the historical context of, of the rubber industry and perhaps colonial uh, colonization processes that may have occurred in Brazil that influences the current status of social capital, but how, how um, other influences of perhaps individualism or affluence might, might affect things moving forward is another very interesting question. Yeah, and I know that at the end of the, during that last part of Lula's, um, you know, there was a burgeoning middle class and um, Brazil was, you know, one of those BRIC countries that was really taking off economically. And then there went, you know, after the 2008 financial crisis, it really hit Brazil hard. And you have a lot of people then, the people who had newly entered that middle class starting to leave it again. You have a lot of social disruption, a lot of violence and crime. And then you have the rise of um, Bolsonaro and, and some of those things that are happening. So I think social capital can really, you know, help unpack a lot of those things perhaps also, but it just, um, that's all, you know, has happened since I was there and stuff, so. Yeah, uh, so we'll move on to the next question. Uh, Luz, Helena, would you like to unmute yourself, ask your question? Or I could ask it on your behalf if you'd prefer. Um, so the question was, what role does violence play on leaders in maintaining community social capital? Yeah, I think that was a tremendous, um, you know, as I said, a lot of the people that I traveled and worked with had, you know, persistent death threats um, and death threats in Brazil are different than death threats in maybe some other places where um, there was no protection really and you're in isolated areas and very vulnerable and if you do get killed, maybe nobody's there to really, you know, find out who did it or, you know, so anyway, and, and I tried to show in that map just the the number of people who have been threatened and assassinated. Um, and that's as a result of their capacity to use their social capital to mobilize their communities to do things that people who want to take over that land 
don't want to see get done. So like the creation of these extractive reserves is going to put the brakes on maybe some other, you know, catching interest. And so they don't want to see that happen. They know who moves the needle in terms of who has the social capital to achieve those things. And those people get threatened and killed regularly. And it's been happening um, along the resource frontier for decades, you know, and so occasionally a high profile person like Dorothy Stang in 2005, you know, this American um, nun who was murdered in Pará will happen. But at the same time, that's one case that is high profile, but there are dozens and dozens and dozens that are occurring that don't, don't make international news. And so I could definitely see that the connection between violence and, you know, people who are using their social capital to try to benefit their community. So it seems it might happen, might, might be that social violence is diminishing social capital because perhaps it, it discourages leaders from making some of these connections, but at the same time, a leader's social capital might help to protect them from violence as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, really, yeah, their bravery was awe-inspiring to me to, you know, face those kind of threats and still continue to try to mobilize and do things to help their communities. It's really um, impressive to see, but um, yeah. Yeah. Was there any follow-up question for that one? I think we can move on to the next one. Um, Timothy, your, your question was next. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me let me bring it back up. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, um, Mason, looking through you know reading through your um, your paper, you know you mentioned that you thought that um, progressive like some of the le legacy of progressive Catholic uh, Catholic workers would be like greater in like a, in understanding like have a greater effect on the connections of people, um, and I am curious. Um, like why, like why you were surprised by that low score. Um, and then, it, you know, and there's a couple of follow-up questions to that, but, um, yeah, I just yeah. like to hear you talk on that. Yeah, actually, you know, I was expecting because of this long history of, you know, the Catholic church has been there since the community was founded in 1870, 71. And, um, a fundamental part, you know, throughout Brazilian society. Um, and then this, you know, liberation theology and all the work they did in those communities. And they were continuing to work there. They had the Pastoral Land Commission and other, you know, uh, organizations to help people. So I was expecting that to be really prominent. But then, um, you know, you see in, in some of the results, actually, some of the Protestant communities were just as engaged, if not more engaged. And so that was a little bit surprising to me. And But then, you know, David Stoll has had some books on uh, the rise of, of Protestantism in Brazil and how it's just exploded over the last, you know, 50 years. And in Latvia, there was, of course, the Catholic Church and the prelacy. I went around town one day and I counted, I think, 27 different Protestant church um, entities in this town of maybe 20,000 people or 15,000 people or something like that. And they were all different Protestant churches. So um, there was really an expo explosion of that. And they were also engaged in some of the social mobilization in a different way. If you look at the literature, um, I think that, you know, the, the Protestant church had different ways of doing that. And maybe it's often more conservative and challenging um, social structures and power structures than is the, has been the case for the Catholic Church, particularly during the liberation theology movement. So that was kind of that, the, the shock there is that terms of these, you know, Protestant communities, which may have, be, have a reputation as being less likely to challenge those power structures than, you know, what the Catholic Church in the past with liberation theology. So, so to see them actively engaged with these social movements, just based on that reputation, well, that was the surprise. I don't know if that answers the question yeah no i i appreciate it thank you sir um my kind of my follow-up question then is um you know obviously you said you know community leaders have the greatest you know score 
in, the, in like looking at the coefficient score. Um, what would you say then was like the second greatest contributing factor to people's social capital? Oh, for the linking social capital. Well, the, the other one that I measured was was just the um, the fact that they were in these reserve areas that the organizations also wanted to create the reserves, and so okay. that was just the geographic space there where you know. But I thought that was interesting also, and that also kind of speaks back to that two way nature of the linking social capital where these organizations had things that they wanted to do also and they needed leaders to get those things done um, and they wanted to contact people who were in those spaces where they wanted to create the reserves also and so that was it and then so um you, you know i that i only had a limited number of independent variables for that position generator method so those were those were the ones i used and then um, i tried to flush out in terms of the ethnographic research um, some of the other kind of drivers. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. The next question is from Polly Kronos, who asks about uh, Paulo Freire's legacy. And I'm not sure if you can answer this one. I had to look it up, uh, which is about the critical consciousness, um, which from looking it up on, on Wikipedia, uh, was a popular education and social concept developed in, in Brazil. Yeah, and whether the pedagogy or not, of the oppressed. Yeah, so whether or not this had any impact on the creation of social capital when we're talking about Brazil. Absolutely. Um, if you, when I was at University of um, Florida, I took a class with Maria Legrecci and she was one of the people who worked with Chico Mendes to help mobilize rubber tappers in Acre. And I think people at that time were obviously heavily influenced by, um, by Paulo Freire and his, his books. And um, so one of the things they did um, for those early rubber tapper movements is people wanted to learn how to read. And so they used those teachings on how you're teaching people to read, but you're also teaching them about their circumstances teaching them about maybe why they're impoverished, why they're poor, what are the things that they can do about it. And so I think his work was definitely influential to those people who were, you know, working with Chico Mendes early on and, and even later, I think his work has been, you know, um, definitely influenced people throughout Brazil for those types of things. So do these ideas get all the way to the village leaders to that level, all the way through society? In terms of that that idea of you know you're teaching people to read at the same time as you're teaching them about their circumstances, yeah, I think that was also kind of the approach of the of the Catholic Church during the liberation theology movement, where they're forming these Christian based communities and they're teaching them to preach the gospel, but then within the gospel are all those lessons about life, and you can weave into those lessons people's current circumstances. And you know why they're in the situation they're in, and tie those to Bible verses and things like that. And so, th I think they're kind of parallel in that sense, in terms of you're teaching people how to read at the same time. There's like a consciousness raising effort involved, also. So this might help to explain what appears to be uh, leaders placing a very high emphasis on social capital perhaps relative to other parts of the world where certainly from the work that I've done, I don't see people taking it quite so seriously and putting as much effort and time into it as what seems to be happening in, in this area in Brazil. And so it sounds like these kinds of ideas have, have permeated through society and really influenced the culture on a level that, that has shaped the way in which people basically create their social capital. Yeah, and there's also, um, when, with their return to democracy, um, people got the rights of association that they'd lost under the dictatorship. And one of the things that I was looking at was, um, I think it's in the Brazilian code, um, you know, people had to reform these associations to do a lot of things that they couldn't do as individuals. So you see hundreds and hundreds of community associations where people have to form an association and then in order to get something done. And I think that ties into the way people are using their social capital like we have to do this as a collective so we have to know how to make relationships with one another and then we also have to have relationships to these organizations so that was something that i wanted to do more research on before my injury was just trying to unpack this there's thousands i mean there were so many different 
um, associations and some of them based on ethnicity, some of them based on neighborhood territoriality, some of them based on, you know, all kinds of different things. And so um, I think that plays in. So it's partially them responding to the kind of rules of the road in terms of the Brazilian code and what they have to do to get things done. And, and some of it's also, you know, that historical legacy of how things get done. Yeah. Uh, Mike, did you have a question, comment? I do just very quickly as part comment. I'm struck by the difference as I listen to, to you describe uh, situation in Brazil in comparison with a couple of trips I made to Honduras in which we were instructed by our leadership not to be too helpful with regard to organization that uh, organization might be something the Hondurans, and this was in the, the middle to late 90s, so that time changed too. But uh, while uh, they might be lacking in organizational skills, it's very much an exercise that they need to undertake and not have the North Americans do for them. Um, I mean, uh, given the history, uh, that had taken place. And, and here I, I hear you describing Brazilians being much uh, more aggressive with organization. And is that, would that be correct or, or not? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to compare, definitely. Um, I, I did um, work in different parts of Central America, but not Honduras. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to compare some of these areas. To Brazil, I think they have their own historical context and things. And then, you know, I should point out also that in some communities, you know, that I worked in, they didn't have a lot of strong leaders. They didn't have this kind of mobilization. And so there was kind of a, a spectrum there also in terms of some people were really um, go getters in terms of trying to do this stuff, and other communities were just less involved and more, you know, disconnected and things like that. So. Thank you. Well, I think we're coming towards the end of our time. Um, so if you have any final questions, please raise your hand or post something in the chat. Um, Marion, have we missed anything in the chat? No, I don't believe that we have. I've been asked, I've asked people to put their hands up at this point if they wanted to. So just mentioning okay. that we're going to stay on after you stop the recording for a bit of a chat. Yeah, so we'll, we'll wrap up in just a moment, um, but please stay online for maybe a few more minutes after we, we finish, if you have any, any formal comments or, or questions as well. Uh, so let's wrap up. Um, Mason, thanks very much for your time and effort in, in preparing and, and giving us this talk. So it may be very, very fascinating. Okay, well, thanks everybody for listening to my presentation and asking the questions. And i um, just so glad I wasn't sure if anybody was going to sign on at all, but I'm very happy to have engaged with all of you on this and I just look forward to discussions in the future. Absolutely. And certainly lots of thumbs up and, and likes uh, from, from the audience. So very well received. So next week we have a discussion group in our, in our weekly webinar series. Uh, this is an informal discussion. It's not recorded. It's an opportunity to come along and, and express some thoughts and ideas, ask some questions. And there's always lots of very knowledgeable people involved who can help to answer those questions and engage in discussion. And then the following week, we have a presentation by Professor Eleanor, Eleanor Cario Alvarez on social capital and adolescent health promotion from theory to practice, uh, which is on, the, on July 1st. So we'll, we'll end the recording there. Um, thanks again, everyone, for being involved.